want to drive faster? Listen in as Kinch Rendell, an SCCA National Trophy winner and multi-time pro solo champion himself, interviews the best autocrossers in the land. He talks fast and drives even faster. And now here's your host, Kinch Rendell. This podcast features PJ Corrales. He's got a lot of trophies in ESP, SSM, SM. But you know what's most impressive? He has cars in both a SP class and a modified class, so street prepared and street mod, that are competitive. So I have a couple cars, but I'm not saying they're competitive. Like each car in each class, that speaks to his willingness to have cars set up and be competitive on top of everything else he does. This podcast features a lot of the normal things as well as just some of his different stories. It was fun to chat with him. And once again, just to hear his insights, something I like he said toward the beginning, he goes, I was more of a ricer than a racer when he first started. Started an STS class with subwoofers in the back, he's pretty sure. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Hope you enjoy it. Let us know what you think. You can check us out on Facebook. We'll have a post for him as well as the post on the autocrosstalk.com podcast. All right, on to the show. PJ, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank, thank you for taking the time here on this Sunday night. So tell us, where are you sitting? Where, where are you at right now? I'm just relaxing at home. I uh, actually just came back from the rock climbing gym after watching F1. Um, so. And where is home? What, what state? What city? Um, I live in Rocky Hill, Connecticut, just south of Hartford, Connecticut. Um, Connecticut's not exactly that big. so. And wh- what, what brings you there? Like, what, What's your job? Is that why you went there? I actually, uh, I work for an aerospace manufacturing company. Um, well, we make engines, uh, Pratt and Whitney. Um, I work, uh, actually, I work with Nick Barbado, a fellow racer. Um, we both work for the F100 program. Um, so we are uh, very knowledgeable in the F15 and F16 power plant. Did, did you use any technology on the Panda? Like, is that why it's so fast? Um... I really can't say. Top secret, you know, top it's secret. Kind of proprietary. Don't have the clearance. <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe we'll say some stuff to get Nick to have to come on the podcast to, re, to you know, to, to make up the story. Is it correct or not? So you're an engineer. Is that correct? Yep. Engineering a panda car. So take us back to when did you start autocrossing? How long ago? What were you driving? What got you into it? So I started roughly around 2001. Um, Back then, I probably would have been more of a ricer than a racer. Um, I actually joined and helped found the 240SX Owners of New England Car Club. Um, And basically, a couple of the guys were going to an autocross, and I had no idea what that meant, but because I was involved in the club and when I was one of the founders, I felt like I had to go. So I ended up going and driving about two hours to uh, Moore Air Force Base in Devons, Massachusetts, and that was my first autocross. Um, I ran there. My car ended up classing in STS. Um, tech gave me a bunch of crap about the subwoofers in the back of my car. Um, I think I had Dunlop FM 902 or 702. I don't even remember what kind of tires I had. They were on the ugliest looking wheels you could imagine. I had, I think, Ebox Sportline Springs on KYB GR2 shocks. And that's what put me in STS. So you thought, you're like, yes, I've got this. Did you think you could drive well showing up there? I mean, you didn't really plan to go, or it didn't sound like it's something you're like, oh, I want to go to this. What were your, any expectations um, or big memories from that? I think every guy thinks that they're the best driver in the world. Um, and I'm, I was definitely no different. I thought that I was a pretty good driver. Um, and then finishing second in the novice class, I felt pretty good about myself. And then looking back on the event afterwards, I was like, holy crap, we are slow. Like, I looked at all the, like, the H-Stock guys and, like, whatever. But given those guys were on Hoosiers, I had no idea what those were at the time. Or they might have actually been on Kumo Victor Racers. That was so long ago. Um, Yeah, it was uh, kind of a shocker. And, um, of course, not knowing what I was doing, that was the winner that I went and turbocharged my car because that's what everybody with a 240SX does. They throw a turbo on there, or they do a motor swap or whatever. So I turboed the car and came back next year, and it was like, oh, wait, now I'm in street mod. Uh, So my sophomore year in autocross, I ended up bumping from STS all the way up to street mod and running against guys on our comps. 
And how quickly did you realize, okay, I've got to have R comps and such? Like, how did that advance from, okay, I'm now in this class, I'm looking at results? Um, that was actually kind of a, a funny story in itself. Um, I actually got Victor Racers, I think, a couple of events in. Um, it didn't take long for me to start, like, taking the car kind of to the next level from where I was. Um uh, let's see. I'm trying to think about that. Like, I got, I remember getting the Victor Racers. I remember reading online that I had to break them in, so I drove them around the UConn campus because I was a UConn college student at the time. Um, I remember bringing the tires to the event. They fit in the back seat of the car, which was, was convenient. Um, and then I was racing against... Um, the, I, forgot, I almost forgot his name. Um, it's Brian Levesque's younger brother. Um, Brian Levesque re- has run like EP at nationals a bunch of times, but his younger brother ran like a Civic that I think was also on Victor Racers. Pretty sure it was an EG Civic um, that might have been motor swapped so long ago. It's hard to remember, but re- we went back and forth so many times and we were he was on the Victor Racers, and I was on Street Tires, and I got Victor Racers, and they were kind of both like, yeah, we're going to stay on Victor Racers. And then at the end of the season, I was like, I, uh, I think Hoosier had like a clearance on like AS304s, and they were terrible because they didn't last very long, but they were way faster than the Victor Racers for the amount of time that I had them. Um, and I remember I bought a tire trailer from Harbor Freight. Um, I mocked everything up and threw everything together and ended up like randomly on these oversized tires um one of the guys that was running like a z06 corvette at the time was like looking at my car with the tires sticking out beyond the fenders and just like laughing at it just because of the way it looked um but were they fast uh did you win it took a while but yeah so i ended up winning i forgot what year it was it was, I don't think it was the second year. It might have been the third year. I won the, my first regional championship. Um, and basically it came down to the last race. And because I was so slow for the first half of the year, I wasn't in points contention, contention unless I could get somebody to finish between myself and third place. Oh, uh, wow. Myself and the guy. Uh, actually, I'm sorry. I had, I had to have a guy in the lead finish third for me to win. So I had a friend, um, Jeff McNeil, who I think wrote for Grassroots Motorsports a long time ago. Um, he ended up co-driving my car, and it was tough because he had a year or two more experience than I had uh, driving autocross. So by the end of it, um, I think at the last event, it might have been at like New Hampshire Motor Speedway or something like that, um, we had to finish one, two, first and second in order for me to be able to win. And I remember the, that run like it was yesterday because it was just like the run that I needed to do. And it was like, needed to do it clean, needed to beat my own co-driver. Couldn't like just have a faster car. Also just had to drive faster than somebody who had more experience than myself and ended up pulling it out on like the last run. And it was like one of the most exciting experiences in autocross. And that might have actually been one of the moments that like hooked me, like dug me, dug my basically grave into autocross. And like is probably one of the reasons that I'm like so competitive about it today. You're like, I can do Um, this. Look at this. I I, I could, I I rocked it. Yeah, pretty much. Um, It was kind of fun, (laughs) funny when thinking back about it, it's like, Back then, I was having trouble just beating these front-wheel drive Civics um, with, uh, I think, like 220 horsepower street modified car, and we were still at the time getting raw time like crazy by DSP or probably even FSP at the time. Some of those FSP cars really stick. If the course doesn't have power spots, they they don't slow down; they just keep going. <laughs> yeah, and um, actually, I think that's kind of like when I started taking things to the next level. Um, what actually ended up happening first was I ended up uh, getting a full-time job. When I got a full-time job, I ended up buying my Infinity, my G35 that I've been racing recently in ESP. Um, so I raced that for a little bit. 
Um, and the reason that I actually brought Panda back, my 240, um, was because we had to do a team challenge event at the end of the year. And the way the team challenge event was for New England region, you had to have as many class wins as possible. So we needed to win multiple classes. Oh, I yeah. ran my, I ran my, I think at the time, F stock car and F stock and ESP. And I had Dave White, who we all know is a four time national champion. Um, he actually drove his first time in Panda at that team challenge, non points, just for fun event that we were trying to win. Um, he drove that against Chris Franson or Mike Shields or Nate Whipple, one of those guys. They, these were all big DSP guys back in the day. Um, in Mike Shields' old E36 uh, DSP and uh, uh, three series. Um, so he got he lost to he lost, of course, uh, Dave White lost to the DSP car, um, but he had a ton of fun in Panda. So we kind of talked about it afterwards, and we're like, well maybe we should start taking this more seriously and start developing the cars. So that, that was when we decided that the next year we were going to start doing national events and pro solos and national tours and stuff. Um, that actually same event, um, I actually had to go against, I think it was Lynn Rothney Kozlak in their, I forget what it was. It was like um, a fourth gen, I want to say, Camaro. Um, and I remember like somebody telling me about the Camaro and I was like, oh, you know, it's a, it's an old Camaro. What are they going to do? And I just remember getting smoked by one of the Coslax. Um, but of course they had that thing dialed in and my infinity was bone stock. I don't think I even had shocks at the time. I think I was running like takeoff Kumo, Victor, uh, Kumo V seven tens at that time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's one thing so, I, I try to remind people since we have that little sprint and SP class that you're going against people that have got 10 or 20 years into a car dialing it in like you just don't get to show up there and and even a new car and think oh yeah this would be great it seems like in sp it's so key to have the time and the tweaking in there yeah um it's tough because uh yeah the development takes a lot of it but i think the development curve has become a lot shorter i think there's a lot more information out there especially with the internet especially with people sharing their setups um, people are always talking about um, what they're doing with the car, what you need to do with the car, how the car should feel. And then there's also people that just, I think there's a lot more experienced people that know what the car should be doing versus like when I first started out, at least when I first started out nationally, you know, um, I remember talking, uh, Mark Daddio was lo local to me. So when I was still developing my street mod car, every time, every now and then I'd meet him at like karting or something like that. And I'd, you know, talk to him about like what setup, what, what like we should do, like what I could do with the car. Um, I remember getting into, uh, into it with roll centers and some of the geometry with them and stuff like that. Like that's a lot more common now than it was back then. Like it for me was just convenient that I knew people um, like Mike Shields who developed his, E36, like Mark Daddio, who's pretty much just won everything. You know, like I had a lot of experienced people in the region to help me along, but that was all by word of mouth. That now happens a lot faster with the internet, with social media, with forums, with like everything that people can access now. Yeah, good point that not only can you read about it, but you can just directly message somebody and ask them. Yeah, like, so my ESP car, I'm in the third year of development in it, and I, I feel like I probably should have won two national championships by now. I mean, I, it's in the car, I should say. Um, I obviously didn't have the either conditions or the driving to be able to do it. But, like, the pace of development, like I said, is so much faster that the second year into the car, it's starting to start getting maxed out already. Um, yeah, like, you, you knew enough from the first so many years of being in street mod that you said, okay, I've got to do this, this, and this. And maybe even you can touch on this. What does or what do you feel or what do you think if you know a car is working well? So I think that's a that's a tough question to, to really answer. So a lot of it develops uh, depends on the driver, and a lot of the times I feel like people end up catering the car to their own driving style, and will actually kind of slow the car down a bit, trying to make it comfortable for them to drive. 
um, whether or not it's balancing out understeer or oversteer or dialing in something um, and then inadvertently making the car not handle as well in another aspect. Um, but that's actually something that um, I've had to do naturally to work around not catering to a certain driving style because I've always had driving, driver, co-drivers that basically have the opposite driving style of myself. Um, my, uh, like I prefer the car to be a little bit looser. Uh, my initial co-driver for a lot of my national events, Dave White, he prefers the car to be tighter. Um, I want to be feathering the throttle. Dave wants to be full throttle. I want to be minimal steer input. Dave wants to just mash the steering wheel. Um, and it's the same thing now that I have with Brian Mancuso, who's my current driver, uh, my, my current co-driver in the ESP car. Um, he is more ham-fisted on the wheel. I'm more minimal steering input. And making the car work for both of us just ends up making it faster everywhere. Are you both having so, to adapt to the middle, maybe, in between the two setups you might ideally want? Um, every now and then, but when you really get it nailed. Um, so we played around with the car a lot this year, and I ended up making some changes before bringing the car to the pro finale. And I had only run one pro, finale, pro event in a Skoda this year, um, and my co-driver had done two, so he was eligible for the finale. So I made a couple spring changes before we ended up going out to the pro finale. Um, I ended up doing a little bit of a geometry change, and he goes out, he does a run, I make one more change, and then he just he comes back and he says, don't touch the car. The car is fantastic. I took the car to the practice course, and then I felt like the changes that, were, that I had done still made the car faster in other areas, so I was happy with it. And we both had a car that handled perfect for both of us. And, yeah, I probably could have got, done something that would have catered more to him and might have hurt me, but... I think having a lot of the setup background from Panda helped me make a setup change for him that didn't in a, didn't adversely affect the setup for the way I wanted to drive it. So basically, once you start developing this skill set in knowing what to adjust, whether you want to adjust toe, ride height, camber, um, you name it, like you can adjust your your shocks, your spring rates, your sway bar rates, your um, basically biasing the car fore to aft or laterally. Uh, there's all these things that you can do to the car, and every single change that you do is going to affect some other part of the system. Um, but knowing how it's going to affect the other part of the system and whether it's going to affect something that you want it to do or whether you something that you're already happy with, that's when you have to start taking that into account. So Yeah, so are you looking at the clock and results a lot of times to determine? Like when, and since it's hard to say when a car is working well, like is that what you're basically basing it off of? No, I mean the the times should come from driving. Ultimately, everything you're doing with the car is driving. Um, you're not going to make the car faster if it's harder to drive. Um, so if the car itself is faster, but you can't utilize that, then there's no point because you're going to be slower because you're never going to actually take the car to its maximum. Um, a good, a good case for that is actually, um, with street mod street mod where power, we're not limited by power. We can make as much power as we want. If I wanted to, I can make Panda make 600 horsepower, but can I use that? Is that going to make the car harder to drive? So I could make the car on paper faster because a car with more horsepower is always going to be faster than a car with less power on paper. But if you can't use that power, if you can't put it down, or if it makes it harder to to throttle in the turns or throttle out, then that's not going to have the right effect in the end. So really what you want to do is is figure out like how to make the car drivable without slowing it down doing so. Um, because, yeah, on the, on the flip side of that, you can make the car slower you can reduce the amount of ultimate grip that you have to make it less understeery or oversteery. Um, yeah, it's, it's funny because it's always going to be a catch 22 with tuning with setup. Uh, you're, you're always going to want to like 
make a change to make it easier to drive without adversely affecting the overall handling. But the number one thing is going to always be make it easier to drive, make it do everything well. Um, and I guess that's the other thing too, is if you're making it easier to do one thing, you have to make sure it's not making something else harder to do. So if you want the car to be looser, you also don't want to make it hard to put down power. Yeah, exactly. I, I get that thinking about the, not the cars I usually drive, but the higher horsepower ones. If let's say you have a turbo that comes on really hard, that's probably not a good thing when you're trying to feather and get back in into the throttle coming out of turns or you have too much lag and such. That part I can totally relate to. Thinking about everything yeah. you said, do you feel like you're very good at feeling the different things like mid-turn, mid-turn, mid-sweeper grip versus exit versus entry? Or is that how you're um, refining things with ride height or do you know this from practice or changing those things and noticing the differences? I think it's a little bit from practice, a little bit from the engineering background. Um, I think as an engineer, I'm pretty good at seeing things systematically and seeing how things interact with each other. Um, but then there's also, of course, the experience that I, like I've done certain changes, so I know what a certain change is going to do. But you kind of want to vet it, too. So knowing the theory and knowing the engineering and the, the, the science behind it definitely helps. Um, should something, in theory, make this better or make something else worse? And knowing the why helps you figure it out. In addition to like adapting that to your experiences, like you, if you've made a camber change before, you know whether it's how much it's helped. And I think the experience helps really more for how much you need to make an adjustment. Like, will a eighth inch toe be beneficial for this, or do I need to go all the way up to a quarter inch toe? You know, and is, is, you said engineering wise, did you read any books or forums or talking to people or is it just base engineering knowledge? Like where would you suggest somebody pick up that knowledge if I'm not an engineer per se? Um, for non-engineer, I think that's a little tougher, um, but definitely read as much as you can. Um, I haven't read any books specific, specific to car tuning. Um, I've engaged in a lot of dialogue online. I've talked to a lot of people that I know. Um, but let's see, I think, I think without the engineering background, you still just want to saturate yourself with as much information as you can. So I'd probably recommend the books and like the things on car tuning. Um, yeah, there, there's a lot of information out there now too. Um, especially with all the forums that are out there with social media, with like the internet groups and what have you, where people have all these experiences. Um, the thing you have to be careful of though, is there's also a lot of just things that are word of mouth and things that are just like, well, this is the way it's always been. So people are always going to generally say that more camber is going to give you more grip. Well, there's going to be a point where there's too much camber and you'll have less grip in something like braking or acceleration, depending on which end of the car you're talking about, or you might be over cambering the car. And then also over castering the car, in which case you're still going to also not have as much tire contact patch. Um, so it's tough because you're going to fight against some misconceptions that are out there. But I think that's when seeking out the information and gathering as much of it as you can, you can kind of vet for yourself what you need to believe, what you would need to take with you when you want to do your own setup. Yeah. But really, the, the science and the engineering background is, is going to help you. So if you can start to develop that, then that'll help when you see somebody talk about an idea, like when you talk about camber, the, the whys of why camber helps. Well, it's because the car is going to be rolling in a turn. Well, how much of the car is going to be rolling? Most people say that, um, well, this is going to go into the uh, 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 common knowledge kind of thing, but most people say the car should be leaning approximately two degrees at its max roll, you know, so then you need to account for tire roll. So you're going to add a little bit more than that. Mm. So your camper should be roughly three to four degrees, uh, taking, depending on what kind of tires you're running. And that's what most people are going to say. Ballpark, you should be running for camber. Um, for the most part, it works. Um, whether you want to be at the low end or the higher end, then you're talking about geometry. You're talking about other things, but you want to know why that camber is going to help. You know, you don't want to just say, well, 
amber just adds traction because that's not really true. Not everywhere, amber especially. Amber traction because you're increasing your contact patch. You're increasing your contact patch by matching your body roll and tire rollovers. So. No, nice. I don't think anybody's ever said that anything close to that. Thinking about the the body roll of the car and the amount how much the tires are also deforming, I guess, or are giving giving way. No, I like that. I like that thought. And that's that's things that people can pick up on, like you saying, read different things, and that gives an idea there to go Google and think about. Because it's interesting, as I've been running the Civic, I usually leave the alignment alone. I'm just too lazy, whatever, don't really think it matters to change it. And when I ask people that have both been fast in the car, it's funny. I've asked national champions in the same car at times, and they're totally opposite. One's like, oh, it's way too much camber. The one's, oh, it's plenty of camber. More of the merrier. So once again, that's where I feel like the testing has to come in, I guess. The tire temp is one thing, and then just the clock, I guess, to really see does it make a difference or not. Yeah, uh, and it's tough with the clock, too, because it, it, when you talk about the clock, is that because you drove it better? Yeah. Um, is that because the way the car was set up let you drive it better, or was that just because the car itself was better? And that's when you had to have to dif differentiate, um, like I was talking about earlier, so possibly contradicting myself on earlier. Oh, yeah. Um, that's where now I remember, it, as you said, that Ryan, I think it was Ryan Davies, had a Facebook post about having a passenger and how much does that really matter and it's so funny, somebody chimed in and said, well, until you're really, really consistent, like within a tenth or two, you can throw out the weight or not the weight. And that's what's so crazy in the sport. Any little thing can cost you a championship. We said that, I think you said that before we started recording. Any little thing, oh, yeah. it's so hard. And that's where I'd always heard John Ames say, a passenger's worth a second. So I, in back of my mind, I'm always like, oh, when I have a passenger, it's at least a second. Because John was driving Corvettes back then, as he is now. I'm like, oh, then in my little car, it's got to be at least a second. I have no clue what it's worth, but I guarantee you in a little car that weighs like 2,000 pounds, it makes a difference. And for me, the, the thing I feel is the braking. I just can't slow down as much. Maybe it comes back to the camber. I might have too much camber to get the good contact patch. But all these little things, until you're super consistent, which we may never be, the clock is hard, like you're saying. Yeah, it's, a, it's one of those things that is always going to be debated till the end of time. Um, how much certain thing affects the overall time, how much does weight affect it. Um, sometimes weight can be good. Sometimes having the ballast on the other side of the car yeah. will make it handle evenly left and right. Sometimes it's just going to hurt you just because the course is going to be more power and braking dependent or just it throws the car off. Um, I know a couple people that in their Miatas, they actually stagger their spring rates because the cars are so so light that you know they they have a 50 pound stagger between the right side and the left side of the car just so it's balanced out um exactly if you had the same spring rates left and right then the passenger might have offset that and then the car would handle the same left and right and like i said it's it's just going to come down to you is the car more or less drivable and yeah once again yeah with the weight there with the weight there i guess if it's if it's a negligible difference in the way the car handles then you're probably going to say that, yeah, it's definitely going to slow you down. But, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I've had this debate with a, a few people. But it's, it's kind of funny when you think about um, how much does X amount of weight change your overall lap time and trying yeah. to make a general statement, it's never going to work. Especially like you made me realize when you said, if the cars turn better one direction than the other, by default, and then you put a passenger in that, then makes that better. If your course is mostly, let's say, left hand sweepers, and get, those get better with a passenger, then actually maybe it helped you out once again because it, you didn't have a lot of braking or acceleration zones where the weight would really hurt you. So, so hard to know. And that's where I'm, I'm thinking, I wonder if video games could actually, would a computer, if you could somehow add the weight to it, could it interpret better than ever we could because we can't drive consistent enough to know it? So, somebody yeah, out there, probably, figure that out. <laughs> It would probably depend on the geometry that they're using and the physics uh, engine that they're using. Um, it'd probably be a good question for Grant Reeve. There we um, go. He's he's another racer, uh, of course, oh, sponsored by iRacing. Grant is Grant said he did not want to come on the podcast. So everybody that knows him should go ahead and say, "Hey, Grant, please come share some information." We spoke at Nationals this year. I'm like, "Come on, no, no, no," he said. I'm like, "No, really, we're just chatting on the phone call. It's okay." So anybody that knows him, if you want to hear some stories and thoughts, please. Please go solicit. Yeah. He's a fun guy to talk to about too, because he's also he's got that engineering mind, and I've I've had plenty of conversations with Grant, 
especially because he's a good friend of mine. Um, <laughs> we've talked a lot about car setup and uh, the physics and everything like that. So that I'm leads actually me... actually surprised that he doesn't want to come on here, but... Yeah, I, no, guess, I, I guess you could kind of see that. <laughs> He'll talk to you, like, offline about it all day, but... <laughs> You gotta share, share the knowledge, even just stories. You don't have to share all the secrets or anything. So you, you've talked to lots of people about setup and such. Do you also do anything with video? Do you share video with people to get them to review it? Do you do that yourself with co-drivers? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I post a lot of videos online. Um, I definitely go over videos with co-drivers. Um, that's actually one of the things I think I do better than driving is uh, looking back and seeing it, what it, seeing what I did right and wrong and could improve on or what I need to do again. Um, kind of wish I could do that without having to rely on video, but um, I think video really helps, especially if you can see the driver input. And then once you've looked at video enough, you can kind of get a feel for how the car is handling. So I've actually looked at some other videos um, and just noted to people that I'll think their, their car is either um, loose or tight or whatnot. Um, so Tamara, you, Tamara Hunt has actually shared a lot of video with me in the past, and I've given her some some feedback. Whether it's helped her or not, I, I can't really say. But uh, she's she's done quite well, so I guess I'll, I'll just leave it at that. You're like, I'll take a little credit there. I've been helping. I've been helping. And that's where I heard, oh, who was it? Seeing they were sharing with um, Sam Strano and such. The video, I mean, with the Internet once again, now, are there any tips or tricks or things you do with video? Do you play it at half speed? Do you line up two videos next to each other or any software you use, et cetera? Um, so I think Race Render is probably one of the best for doing uh, video comparisons and overlays. Um, and I'll, sh I'll throw that out there because it's one of the few things that I've actually spent money on buying. Um, that and Solo Storm. Solo Storm has actually been really helpful. Um, I think... Generally, within the day, it's hard to look at your video and say you need to do something because you can get caught in a trap too easily to focus on something you caught in a video that may be influenced by something else, uh, whether it's the surface or whether it's something that was quirky with the way the car was handling in the turn, um, trying to understand what all of the variables that were at play in that situation that caused you to be like offline or slow in a corner and how you use that data or video. Um, so I try not to use video too much within the day. Um, I'll, I will look back at it and just make overall comments on the driving technique and style and stuff like that. So that's, that's kind of where I focus more on video. Um, I think that doing the, the video comparisons, doing like a side-by-side -side with like a co-driver, that can also help because you can see, especially if you can see the driver inputs, like are you using too much wheel input? Are you making too many corrections? Or is the car getting loose on an area that the other driver's not? Um, and that you're not going to really see as much in the data, like on GPS traces and stuff like that, when you're just looking at comparison on your position on course. Um, so I think that is helpful for carrying forward, but I try not to do that during the same event because trying to do that makes you kind of like zone in on that one thing. And then typically people kind of like space out on the other things that they might've been doing right, or that they also might need to fix. Um, it's, it's tough. Uh, I'm sure it's different for everybody, but that's just been my takeaway from it. So. Yeah. And one thing um, I can add there is, <clears throat> I love that Solo Storm and Track Me back in the day when I used that shows you the distance and the lines, but also the video. If you have it set up proper, well, and it, if your car allows it, like in the Civic, I can put it on top. I can still see how close we are to cones left and right because you can see them through the through the door window, basically going through the sunroof. And even that, I can tell people, hey, you're too far off. Or if you don't have video, but you have somebody hopping in the car with you, when I hop in, I'm mostly paying attention to where people enter and exit turns, how tight they are. I'll tell people, you had five feet to that cone or two feet to that cone or the slalom cone, you're two feet off. So sometimes video, I think, could even show you that quickly if somebody, if you can play it back and see that. Data I found with Solo yeah. Storm, if it's not lined up right, you just don't know. It's like, oh, wait, I was tighter. A couple of events ago here, I was co-driving with somebody in the STR S2000, 
And he's like, oh, look, I was tired than you. I'm like, there's no way you were tired than me on all these turns. What was offset? But in one turn, he was. And this is where looking at data in between runs, I took off half a second. Because, oh, yeah, for yeah. some reason, I got a little greedy there. Or like you were saying, maybe the surface was something funny or I took a different line and bounced out a little bit. I, for whatever reason, I was not as tight and tight as I thought I would be everywhere. Yeah, it, it's tough, though, because, like, if you have something like a pin turn and you're five feet off the corner, uh, off the cone, um, and you just go back to the video and say, oh, well, I was five feet off the cone, so now I have to get closer to it. Um, your next run, you may go back and you may turn in earlier, but um, if the reason that you were off the cone before was because you broke too late and you turned in on the right point, um, you didn't really fix the problem. So it's, it, I, I, it's, I, I don't know. I, I guess I kind of more go back to trying to think of what I did during the run, um, just replay the run in my head, and I think that's more useful for in the day. And then at the end of the day, I'll, I'll go back and just make general notes on the driving style and what I need to fix. So, now, is that like a notebook, or you keep are you taking notes on a phone, nah. like actually recording them? No, nah, I mean, it's more just like a head thing, um, just general observation. Okay, um, okay. Yeah, at times I have a notebook I that I write little thoughts down in, or, hey, I had this set up, and, or I thought the car felt like this. These are the tire pressures I ran. Not that I look at it again, but I think that helps me memorize, and, or if I had a question, I'd go back and at least see it. Yeah. No, it's, it's probably one of those things, those things that I should do, but uh, I just, I don't know. I kind of wing it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I can relate usually. On most things, the fact they even have that book, I'm like, sometimes now I take it, I'm like, I didn't write anything in it. I forgot. I totally forgot. To, I actually put, It's almost like journaling about what went on and how it feels. Run one and felt like this. Let's adjust the tire pressures five pounds and try that. So when I have it, it's almost like it makes me, if I think I'm going to use it, I'll actually experiment more. I'll try some different things there. And a lot of these thoughts that we were just talking about, I think that if you're very experienced, you don't need to look at those details. You can't, like you're saying, you can't find something that's really going to help you that much very quickly. But I think for a lot of people that are seconds off the pace, there's probably more glaring issues that they could figure out, whether it is, I always think tighter line is usually the biggest deal, or not braking properly, like you were saying, at the right spot, yeah. or accelerating hard enough, or getting to max speed. So... For some people, I think that they can definitely take that with a grain of salt. They might be very experienced, whereas other people probably really can make those big gains because of that. They can go, oh, wow, yeah, I was way off those cones. I didn't know that. Yeah, but, I mean, uh, that, that kind of goes back to one thing. One of the things that I said before is that you have to know why. Um, it's not just being off the cones. It's knowing why you're off the cones. Part of that you can kind of get from video. A lot of that you just have to, like, look back on um, and, and – if you can see that between runs and if you can see that, yeah, you broke too late or you turned into, you didn't turn enough or you turned in too late or whatnot, then um, that more power to you, I guess. But I, I think it's a lot harder to try to see that within the five minutes that you have between one run and the next run. And, you know, you're, you're scrambling, you're doing all the other things that you may need to do. I mean, if you're at solo nationals, you may have tire blankets or spraying tires or what, like all this other stuff. Um, I, so I, I don't know. I, I think if I try to focus too much on the video, then it takes away from the other things. Like, I'll, I'll have my own mental notes from what I did last run. I'll ask my co-driver what he thought of the course. Um, but I try not to do too much because I don't want to drive. I don't want to drive something prescribed. I don't want to drive something that, like, I'm forcing myself to do. I want to drive in the moment. I want to concentrate on what the car is doing where the corner is, uh, whether the car is doing what I want it to do, or and then what adjustments do I have to make in that moment? Not just, well, I need to be closer to that cone, so I'm just going to do closer to the cone, and that may just slow me down, you know? Oh, exactly. I think that's the same thing that gets people stuck um, when people have trouble hitting cones, and they say, I need a clean run. Then all they think about is the distance of the cones. They don't think about the entry, the exit, the mid corner, the throttle, the all the all the things that they need to be doing to drive, and they think about distance. So it's getting caught in that that end state without thinking about what you need to do to get there. Yeah, good point. That they're focused on one thing, so other things fly out the window, like driving to the limit. 
Um, I, I, and that's happened to me before. Um, I had runs at nationals where it was actually my first nationals was like that, where it was like, oh, I just don't want to hit cones. And I was so far off everything that I had a friend from back, actually, uh, my my now brother-in-law, Todd Keen, was uh, raw time me. I, I forget if it was in the same heat or not, but I just remember after my second run, knowing his time and knowing what I was doing, um, this was, I think, I forget what year it was. It was the last year of uh, Topeka. Um, I remember going out there and being like, I'm not really driving the car. Um, and so the third run, like I went out there and drove the car and of course picked up a decent amount of time and was more representative. But like, if you focus in on one thing, then it, it just makes everything else harder to do. Yeah, I, the hero run thing is not really... I try not to even think that I'm going to tell myself that. I say, hey, I've got another run. I've got another run. And as you're saying, you want to drive yeah. in a moment. So take us to what you're doing on course walks. How many? What are you thinking about? What are you trying to pick up on without maybe over-programming yourself is kind of what I think I would, would summarize how you want to drive in a moment. Um, so course walks especially, it's it's more just picking out what cones you really want to pay attention to. It's It's not to rehash the overused phrase, but just pick out your key cones and, and figure out what you want to do. Um, something that I'll tell other people about when I'm driving with them, it's not only just the key cones, it's what you want the car to be doing on entry and around those cones. Um, so just dialing whether or not you want to backside a cone makes that key cone that much more effective than just a cone that you want to be close to or pay attention to. Um, I don't, it's tough because like, I don't typically visualize um, per se what I want to be doing. Um, I'll kind of drive the course in my head, but I don't want to like go back into the car and then just drive what I thought in my head. I just, it's more of gauging, I guess, where I want to like roughly I, I, I don't know how to, how to really put it into words, um, how to set the car into the state that you want it to be in without trying to dial in exactly, okay, I want to break in here. Because it, once you start driving the car, if you had set a break point while you were course walking, um, if you nail the corner before and you're going a lot faster, you're obviously going to have to break earlier than you thought you were going to have to. Exactly. Um, that's the big point I tell people that every run, most people, especially if you're learning, you're going faster and faster or pro solo, you're probably going faster into elements. So your breaking point actually is scooting back. I kept doing the opposite. Yeah. Even experience when I was doing well, I would try to break later and later and later. And it finally hit me like, dude, you're probably going faster and faster through every element. So slow down just a little bit sooner. Yeah. I, I will say that during my course walks, I know I want, like I basically plan where I want the car to be. And on occasion, I'll walk where I know the car is going to end up, knowing that I'm going to miss that turn. Um, so you walk so a very walk practical line, so you're walking, okay, I'm probably going to end up over here? Yeah, I definitely do that. So you're not necessarily walking a tight line. So I would say I try to over-optimistically, well, I think I walk a very the line that I will probably be on within a few feet, which I lately I've been telling people, I'm like, there's no way you can get there. I'll, I'll now vocally say things to people, especially if I kind of know them. Even if I don't, I'm like, can you really get over there? But I am optimistic that I'm like, I want to be over here close to these cones. And I don't, yeah. I guess I don't think I'm gonna make a mistake, but I'm definitely going, please, I'd like to be here. I think if I can't be here, okay, I, I won't make it here, but I'd like to be a few feet closer yeah. in, I guess. I think that can get you off guard though. Cause one thing that can happen on that is you can enter the corner, you can recognize that you're going to be missing where you want it to be, and then you'll slow it down to get where you want it to be when really what you should have done was readjust for the next turn and then just take it from a different line. Um, oh, true. Okay, so yes, I agree that when I'm, when I'm driving, if I make a mistake, let's say, that puts me on a different line, I don't want to have a double whammy. So I don't want to yeah. then... And this is interesting because this would probably catch me at some point thinking I probably said the opposite at some point. 
I don't want to double whammy myself where I'm like, okay, I'm going to have to do something very drastic to get back to the line here because it may not be important. So what I realized when I got in the civic class, ST, whatever it was at the time, was I felt like I was driving really tight on exits and I wasn't doing well. So I said, you know what? Quit trying to be so tight on exits and keep your foot in the throttle no matter what. So I feel like if anything, I started adding some distance on exits. From what you're like saying, if it doesn't matter, keep your foot in it. Don't slow down. Just get back on some tight line. Yeah. Yeah, then the other thing that can possibly happen is if you're if the line you walk just isn't the fastest line, you're sticking to that, and you're not making the adjustment to take the course on the faster line. Um, yeah, that, that it can it can definitely hurt you for sure. So when you're talking about the entries and exits, one th- how I think about when I'm walking the course, I think about what angle I want my car at. Like, so I think about the side of the car by the cone. I'm like, oh, I can have it at this angle or this angle or this angle. When I approach here, ideally it's going to be facing this way. That's the only way I think of it. I have no clue. When I'm driving, I'm not thinking about that. I'm looking ahead, I guess. And I think looking ahead fixes all these things. It's in the moment. It's everything else. That's when I drive well. But as you're thinking about your entries and exits, are you thinking about the angle of the car or anything or steering inputs? or? Yeah, I mean, you kind of want to know whether it's important or not to really get the car rotating on entry um, versus whether it's okay to have the car like pushing a little bit, um, that'll, that'll gauge how important like threshold braking and trail braking is going to be, um, coming into a corner and whatnot. Um, and then even other corners where you may or may not have to lift, um, trying to gauge what you want the car to be doing there. Like the angle the car needs to be, to be able to fit through a gate, you know, does it have to, do you need some slip angle to be able to get through there? on entry and then make it through like some bus stop or chicane uh, without tagging the cone on the back tire. Um, I, I wish I could say I ever thought of that in my life, but driving front wheel drive most of the time, I've never thought about inducing yeah. slip angle to get through something. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I remember back in the day watching Nate Whipple in his STSEG um, and he had tons of slip angle through every slalom. It was just, I, I remember the first time seeing him, just like wiggling the car through a slalom with the car, the back end, basically just like I don't even remember, know how he did it, but it looked like the car was just like throttle steering through the slalom with the back end, just somehow rotating around the cones that it should have been hitting otherwise. He, um, he probably was lift so, lift over steering. Yeah, it's it's definitely possible to do it in a front wheel drive car. Um, that was actually how I tried tried the slalom a lot uh, initially when I had set up my street mod car um, with a little bit of slip angle through the slaloms. And was that inducing with a lift or a brake or with gas? Um, yeah, a little bit of just throttle, throttle and throttle lifts. Um, I actually dialed that, that back a lot, and actually I only recently started doing that again in the Infinity. Um, so as I it. said, like I've always driven with co-drivers that like the car set up differently with uh, Dave you like the car a little bit tighter, so I had to, with the car set up for both of us, um, I wasn't able to do that as much, um, and the car ended up driving tighter. Um, I think actually mostly because towards the end of when I was driving the car, I kind of missed the setup. Um, so I think it actually could have been faster than it was, but um, with the Infinity, it's just been perfect. And even with Bancuso, who doesn't like the car typically the way I like it, he's been perfectly happy with it. And I can still make the car do what I wanted to do. And this is interesting. So you you're not lifting or braking at slalom cones. You're trying to well, I guess you lift after you add some gas. You're trying to blip the throttle at some point in the um, slalom. It depends. It depends on the slalom a lot. Um, if you're oversped into the slalom, it's one thing. If you're undersped through the, into the slalom, yeah. it's obviously another. You know, when you're when you're accelerating through the slalom, then you're obviously using more gas. When you're oversped in the slalom, you're kind of trail breaking into the first couple of cones and then using throttle lifts for the rest of it. Okay, okay, okay. And I, I loved hearing you say that. I hope Brian Peters hears this. <laughs> One thing is, is by his interview, he's like, oh, I knew I shouldn't have said never break into a slalom. Because so often I found myself doing that. It may not be best. Y'all shouldn't all try it necessarily. Yeah. Well, maybe you should experiment. But certain things, certain times, I find if the slalom we have to go slower or there's no, no benefit at the end, if I can bear, barrel in there with more speed, I'd rather go over that pavement at a higher speed if I can. 
it gets very dicey, at least in front-wheel drive cars, of hitting the brakes right, not not rotating too much or pushing. But it seems to work at times. So I think at times there's, of course, everything, like you said, I asked you a question about slalom. They are so different depending on what was before and after them and how they're spaced. Yeah. I don't know. If, if Peters is telling you one thing, then I'd, I'd probably follow that. I mean, I've... I ran against him my first year in ESP, and uh, he's the real deal. Oh, exactly, exactly. I, it's so. just in case so when he listens, he'll be like, I knew I should He just told me, I knew I shouldn't have said that. And like, cause, I mean, if you have a big enough, I remember shortly after that interview, I swear, John Ames is some course, I don't think he even designed it, and he's flying in the slalom and braking. It's because at certain times you have a big opening getting into it, and it's easy to do that or something. So once again, no, no rules 100% every time because the courses are all so different. I mean, every oh, sleeper yeah. is slightly different unless you have a test course or something. And I, I just, I never even, like you're saying, pre-program on course walks. I used to do that. Oh, I should break here. And I broke. I'm like, that was stupid. Why'd you break? I'm like, oh, because I told myself I need to break here. So when people come up and ask me questions, where are you breaking? I'm like, you shouldn't even know where you're breaking. You should be looking ahead and going, I've got to go over there. Where should I break at? That's kind of now my advice don't ever yeah. ever pre-program a brake spot yeah it's it's tough i mean you, you can say whether or not you're breaking into a corner um versus not breaking but saying where you're breaking is going to always depend on whether or not you made the last corner right or not and had the right speed so and, and that's where i swear on soul storm and those those different ones you can move half a second from one element to the next so you're like oh look yeah. i have so much faster than this element yeah, but did you overcook the next or vice versa? Yeah. That thing I learned very, I love segment analysis, but you have to look at two or three together at times because it's very I mean, easy, easy to, to move that time around. Even when you talk to people and it's like, oh, well, I, did, I didn't even break there. I didn't lift there. And it's like, well, how fast were you going yeah. then? Were you, because I'm like breaking or slowing the car down to make it to the corner and I'm not going to do it otherwise. Yeah, and that's where, I guess a couple times I had other people get in my car in the in years and years ago, and they did not break somewhere where I did, or they broke way less. And I totally just said, for, that's probably back in the day when I kind of pre-programmed things. I was like, what the heck? He, we, we went through there. Actually, I actually remember it was Bob Klingler in one time. I was like, how the heck did he do that in this Integra? Well, I can do it too then. I mean, that, that's one thing I tell people is, for me, getting people in the car and or having me in a car, coaching or receiving the coaching is beneficial. Have you done much on that end? Of uh, Are you doing that with co-drivers? Did you get input that way? Did you learn anything that way? Do you still do any of that? Um, sorry, what was that? So basically, like, uh, do you help people by riding with them, and have you been helped by having people ride with you, or are you riding with them? Um, yeah, I, have, I think I've helped a few people by riding with them. Um, I don't know that people riding with me has helped me as much lately. Um, I know initially it did a lot. Um, I don't know if that's influenced my driving style to be the way it is now. Um, I had uh, Chris Franson and Mike Shields a lot in the car with me uh, initially. Um, mostly Chris Franson. We were really good friends back in the day. He co-drove Mike Shields' car when Mike Shields won his national championships in DSP. Um, but yeah, he, uh, he gave a lot of feedback into what I was doing, what I needed to do. You know, using throttle, using steering input and stuff. And, um. You know, I think that's key. Like you said, early on it helped. And that's where even a couple of events ago, a co-driver jumped in and rode with me and then quickly took off, I don't know, a second, second, half, two seconds. He just realized he wasn't aggressive enough. Or he, I think he was also saying, he basically thought he had to brake sooner and sooner. Then he rode with me and was like, oh my goodness, you're braking later and really hard. So the aggression level is something he picked up on right away. So some of you might be kind of getting fast and within a second or two. And if you haven't hopped in with anybody, I highly recommend that you do just to get the feeling. And the passenger seat to me is always feels faster, but maybe that's what you need to feel is those G-forces and feel like, wow, that was fast. I can really attack this yeah. harder. I, I guess I'm also kind of spoiled because the only people that I've been riding with lately are like multiple nat time national championships or national champions of like... Yeah, I think actually everybody that I've co-driven with at Nationals has won at Nationals. Um, 
Yeah, it's yeah, huge. That's actually, that's actually a true statistic. Um, mm-hmm. David White, Todd Keene, and Brian Mancuso, you, and you, Tom O'Gorman. Man, you, it's hard to be your co-driver. Got to bring, got to yeah. bring some, bring some trophies with you. The the only asterisk there is Mancuso because uh, he won Street Mod Front Wheel Drive the year that it was a supplemental class ah. or provisional class, so he never can get a jacket for that. So <laughs> if you include that in the podcast, he'll enjoy that. He'll hey, probably we, hate me, but we got it. Hey, he, he he was the fastest. <laughs> He nailed it. Yeah, but but the rest of them are legit national champions. Oh, oh now you might hate it. Had to had to throw in legit, <laughs> sanctioned, jacketed. You got you got to start somewhere. Some people, oh, I guess you don't have to start with that, but that's a okay. I would not complain. We got to get a jacket, but I was yeah. the fastest. Yes, I did it. So that that's good info. Oh, how many times are you walking a course and such? Um. So. At a, at a national event that I care about, I'm going to say I'll walk a course two or three times. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to try to overwalk it. Um, that was one thing that I learned, um, I, don't, I don't know how long ago, but um, I remember nationals, I would walk the course, I would walk the course, I would walk the course, I would keep doing it. And eventually you would have this notion in your mind of, what you should be doing on the course because you've walked so many times and that all just goes out the window and you don't know what to do with yourself when you're driving and the line is different or the speeder is different than you had built this up to be um, and you had kind of ingrained it in your head. Um, So I try not to overwalk it, but that also might be a product of having walked so many courses and seen so many elements that I kind of know what, they should be doing. So I don't know if it's really more of the latter or more of the former. Um, but I definitely don't want to be, like I said before, walking and setting points that I think things should be and driving specifically that. I, I, I want to leave it so that I'm driving the course. So once I know where the course is going, once I feel like I know where the key points are, then that's where I'll pretty much be fine with it and I'll just drive. Yeah, I can definitely relate to that. Not not over walking. I've done that too where I'm like walking and walking, like why am I walking? But it's a workout, I'm getting kind of tired. Just the moment to me is looking ahead. If I don't know it a thousand percent, like I may walk at my mind afterwards and such, or actually now locally I might walk once and do some mental walks. But I want to make sure I'm just looking ahead because as soon as I think I know it, it it's not going to be as it's not going to be my best for sure. Yeah. So cool. So you're walking two or three times there. Um, any other? I'm trying to think what else that you can think back to that really helped you early on. It sounds like definitely having people ride with you and you ride with them early on was helpful. Did you do any classes per se, or like how many events did you make, or do you take classes? Um, so I've actually never done a school or a class, um, never did Evo school, even though like, uh, it would have, I think it would have been good for me. Um, during, so right when I bought my infinity, um, I basically did as many autocrosses as I could. And there were, there was a time when I drove down to Virginia, uh, on a Friday night, actually we ended up in like South Jersey stayed there, went to, drove the rest of the way to Virginia. Um, and this is, I don't even know how many hours, like on Friday night traffic, it was like six or seven hours of a drive. Um, just so that we could do a local autocrossers Inc event at Ripken stadium, which is this like tiny parking lot because there wasn't anything closer than that for an autocross on that Saturday. Um, we packed up after doing the morning heats at Ripken stadium and drove to New Hampshire, uh, New Hampshire Motor Speedway, to do a local club event there, which was also a postage stamp. Uh, basically just drove to any event that we could possibly do. And this was uh, one of my coworkers and I, Paul Klein, um, who has done a couple events. I don't think he's done too many national events, but uh, was more in a shifter carts lately. Um, but either way, we... Uh, we just drove everywhere um, and anywhere that there was a race that we, we would just go and it was just building up as much experience as possible. 
So how I many what, how many max events do you think in one year you've done? I don't know. Uh, the equivalent of 40,000 miles on a car. <laughs> Get, getting around everywhere. Yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah. I, I did learn that there were a lot of places that I will not go back to. Um, <laughs> I forgot. There was some bank in Philadelphia that Philly region ran at, and that was just horrible on the tires. It was like a cheese grater. Um, South Jersey Motorsports Park was kind of the same way. Um, and then the worst of their autocross event I ever went to on Long Island. Um, I forgot if it was a Coliseum or not, but um, we had done an endurance karting event on Saturday. So after six hours of go-karting, we wanted to go to an autocross the next day, and that seemed like a good idea. So we go to this event on Long Island for New York region. Um, the course was horrible. It was basically like three, like, roundabouts that were connected and you had to do them in a specific order um halfway through the day enough people were off course that they decided that they needed to do a uh, parade lap being led by the course designer who got lost on the parade lap um i want to say that at least two cars caught on fire and a mustang ran into a porta potty oh so hopefully, hopefully empty. yeah that I, I got to see a lot of things from racing all over, although all of that was just in one event. <laughs> Sounds like you have, I guess, within six hours with traffic, quite a few places you can go to. Yeah, it's um, it's one of the benefits of the East Coast, I think. Um, right, so the, uh, I've actually got two really good sites to go to that are pretty equidistant, maybe an hour and a half to two hours away. Uh, one being... Uh, what, would, what should be my home course, New England region's uh, Moore Airfield in Devons, Massachusetts, um, which has hosted a number of tours over the years. And then, of course, MetLife Stadium in uh, upstate New Jersey, East Rutherford. Um, they've held tours and pro solos and all sorts of things, and they've got a really good site there. Um, so two premier sites just for local events that I can do Saturday and Sunday if I really wanted to. Um, so that helps out a lot. Yeah, no kidding. That's where here, I mean, once you get to six or seven hours, I might as well go to Lincoln. And that's where some people are like, yeah. we should get out there more often. It's like some people do. They go four or five events. It's like, oh, yeah, we can get to that concrete and experience that. But, but believe me, thinking about California and Texas, why would I move there? So I could race more. <laughs> that, that would be the number yeah. one. <laughs> oh, probably within four hours I can make an event almost every single weekend. Adds up. So, yeah. also, that's where the amount of experience. Do you guys have quite a bit of competition? I imagine from the names you've you've already talked about. Do you have lots of good local competition at most of these? Yeah, um, within the class, it's it's tough because uh, it's hard to say. Um, ESP in the Northeast hasn't been as strong lately. I'm going to say. I hope I'm not stepping on any toes. Um, Street mod has actually been more more of a class uh, in the Northeast lately, um, especially now that uh, Dan Stainback has finally brought his car out. He's been, he's been building that thing forever, and uh, I remember the first time that I ever saw his car, um, he, ran, <laughs> he ran against us at, like, uh, I think it was like a Northeast Divisional or something like that, and he, he already knew, like, about Panda and everything, and he was just building up, and he's gone from his car, which was kind of like just street mod just because of a couple mods to now being, I think that it's only a matter of time before he wins a national championship in that thing. There's also Aaron Shu, who's um, pretty close. Um, I think he mostly runs with uh, Philly or DC, but uh, he's not too far away. He'll go up to MetLife Stadium events every now and then. Um, and MetLife, of course, is Dan Stainback's home course. So I've got two really good street mod cars that are really close. Yeah, that's nice. That's uh -huh. so many of us. I think if you're in a class and there's nobody competitive, I have to look at overall index times. And that, I wish it was better, but index changes every year, and you have no clue. I'm always thinking, okay, if I'm yeah. pointing the 990s, at least I'm somewhere around the right spot. Used to, I thought, hey, if I'm in the 970s locally, I can maybe be in the trophies at nationals. That's kind of how. Yep. If, if you don't have much competition, 
you've really got to hopefully have a couple people that are usually very quick and maybe have some championships. Yeah. So it sounds like you not only have fast people around, but also you have some competition in your classes, which is great. Yeah. But there's also, too, that um, I've always kind of tried to get ahead of myself. Um, so I also have Jake Namer from the New York region, or MNJR, northern New Jersey region. I don't know if he's New York or New Jersey. I know he lives in New York, though. Um, he's a former Super Street Mod national champion. Uh, he's got a turbocharged RX-7, and I've been running against him for as long as my car has been turbocharged, and we've kind of gone back and forth, and for a while I was just trying to make sure that I was keeping up with him raw time, and we would have these epic battles in, at MetLife, and he's come up to death a couple of times, and uh, um, tried to get away from Panda. Uh, I think one time he ended up running XP, and uh, we ended up putting Dave in the same class. And he, he just knew it was, it was our home course, and my car is set up for that. And even though his car was an SSM car, he knew the battle was on, and so he was pushing and pushing and pushing. It was it was epic to watch. And how yeah. much do you so, do you, or how yeah. much do you change your setup based on where you're racing? Um, so for Panda, I don't. That that car just performs everywhere. Um, with the Infinity, um, it's dialed in now that I don't think it's going to be more than a one psi change in the back tires, depending on if I'm running concrete or pavement. So you're leaving the shocks and stuff set. Yeah, pretty much. How much did um, or how and how much did you experiment with shock changes or revalving and springs and toe and camber? Was that one year, two years worth of stuff? Were you changing things between events, at events? Um, so things change constantly, but it's generally not because of the site we're at. Um, just trying to get everything dialed in. Uh, Panda's actually gone through a, a lot of evolution in terms of the components that are on it, in terms of the power plant and, and all that stuff. Um, this year at Nationals, for instance, I, I put a new wing on the car finally and um, also had a couple sets of different springs that we had been testing throughout the year. Um, but I'll, ch I'll set the shocks. Uh, one thing that I've always done was generally sh set the shocks to match the springs. Um, and that's talking to somebody that valve shocks or looking up on the Internet once again or talking to somebody? Um. That's one of the things that I love about the Coney's. I don't need to revalve a lot. The adjustment ranges are so huge, uh, and there's not a lot of crosstalk, uh, so I don't have to worry about my rebound and just uh, affecting compression and everything like that. I've actually run, for the longest time, uh, pretty cheap shocks on Panda. They're the Coney 86 series shocks, so they're a twin tube strut insert, and I've been running that front and rear. Um, it wasn't only until recently that I upgraded the fronts, but that's only because we had been sideloading the shocks so much that um, Lee Grimes at Nationals one year took them apart and was just baffled at how much wear I had on the bodies and the pistons. Um, so event uh, eventually I ended up getting the 28 series inverted monotube, which takes away the sideloading on the piston valve itself. Wh which um, series is that? The Coney 28s, 28 okay. 17s. Okay. So really sturdy shock um and with after having them shortened by pro parts uh, haven't really changed much on those since um spent a couple of events getting the valving dialed in trying to match what we had in terms of performance with uh 2086s and after that it's been set and forget um nice. I'll, I'll make a uh i'll make a rebound adjustment in the back every now and then but that's only if there's something that's grossly wrong Usually what I'll find if I'm doing that is that something got loose. And on Panda, that happens a lot. Um, just just by nature of the car being what it is, uh, a fairly light car on 315s making 450 horsepower. Um, how, do you determine, it, it, how do you determine how much power was enough power? Or like you said, you could probably do 600 horsepower. Is it with a lag or something else? Is, was that the determining factor or? So drivability, lag plays a part in that, the response time, the amount of power that you can actually put down. Um, actually confirmed that a little bit uh, this year at Nationals. So unfortunately, my car broke um, on day two at Nationals this year. So I, 
um, I was fortunate to jump, enough to be able to jump into John La- Lachlan's car, um, who of course was this year's ESP national champion. Um, his car, um, and I talked to him about it, and he kind of, I think he agreed with me that if his car had more usable power, basically if it wasn't wheel spinning at 50%, then it probably would have been even faster than it was. Um, because and that's the same thing. You don't want to be mashing the gas and having the car all over the place. Actually, um, Nick Barbado drove Panda at the New Jersey Pro Solo this year, and I actually had a manifold leak, so the car wasn't was lagging a little bit. But even though it was lagging, it would still build boost, and the boost would kick in. Uh, when it kicked in, the car would start wheel spinning. Um, so he even told me after the event when we were just talking about it, like if you could get the car to not lag so much or kick so hard or put so much power instantaneously, then the car would be better to drive. Yeah, um, I could see that where you'd have more power a little bit sooner. You could be accelerating yeah. a longer period of time. I still remember the even the Audi. As soon as boost was building, depending on where I was at in a turn, I'd have to lift off immediately. Because, yeah, once again, yeah. you you just start plowing. <laughs> yeah, it's actually funny, too, because... Um, so, uh, Tamara Hunt drove both of my cars at an event at the end of the year. Um, so, she drove Panda first, and then she jumped in the Infinity. Um, but just because of the way the throttle worked on Panda, because of the boost lag, the boost lag kind of helped the car settle the back end and then build into the power. So, even though it had more power it was a little bit easier to drive, whereas the Infinity, as soon as you touched the throttle, it was um, more power on tip-in. So the adapting from the car that kind of like lagged a little bit to the car that was instantaneous, the car that lagged a little bit ended up being a little bit easier to drive on throttle versus the car that was instantaneous. So Interesting, yeah, because you're, you're at the limit, let's say, in a sweeper, and you mash that pedal too much trouble like you just upset things you yeah. upset weight transfer and that's one thing up here at altitude i could get in a really bad habit and used to just i wasn't i was doing like oh i'm zero percent now i'm 60 or 70 or 80 percent so i like to tell people think about five or ten percent more or 50 percent down up to 60 back to 50 back to 40 back to 50 back to 60 that's what i'm really thinking about with my 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 gas pedal is how much i can do that versus being an on and off switch which evidently, like in your car, the ESP car, all things, you get in trouble there, more so because there is no lag. Yeah, I mean it's it's not it's not even that much power um, on the ESP car, but um, it's just the way it comes in, um, and just knowing the the pedal and how you have to do it. It was the same with Lachlan's car. The first two runs were pretty much just trying to get dialed into that pedal and knowing that fifty percent throttle was virtually the same as full throttle. Wow. And that's so interesting <laughs> talking with some people that have gone from Civics to Corvettes and such about how much you're full throttle in different cars. Whereas, and I've always told myself, that's where power in a Civic really matters. When if you're full throttle 50% of the time, compared to, let's say, that car, you can't go full throttle very often at all. How much it really matters to be on the pointy end if you think you're going to win. Your car better be up for it. Yeah. Yeah. Although, yeah, I think ultimately, so, I mean, it's, it's my opinion, but I, I think that ultimately what really matters for autocross is how the car is going to handle anyways. Yeah, it seems like I think Jeff Wong at some event, he thought he was on three cylinders and still did really well. So it's like, okay, that throws yeah. my whole theory out the window. <laughs> like, okay, maybe it doesn't matter as much as I thought it did. So that's course walk. So you haven't taken any classes. Have you done any coaching at any classes? Um, yeah, so I've taught some of, some of the rookie schools regionally. Um, like I said, I've, I've ridden with other friends and give them pointers and tips on what I think they need to do for their driving. Um, but I think that's more of a product of having more experience than most of the people in the area. Oh, yeah, for sure, for sure. And that's where some people that do lots of coaching, they swear it even helps them. I'm not sure how or why. I'd have to go back and listen again to see all the different reasons. But did you pick up anything from that in riding with people at all? Um, yeah, I mean, a, a couple things. Um, trying to explain to people helps you kind of develop your own ideas um, and simplify them because you have to take this thing that you 
thought you already knew and verbalize it and explain it and try to, I don't know, like dumb it down to a level that somebody who doesn't know as much of the nuances as you might know, you know? So uh, I think instructing and riding along with somebody, even at a very basic level can help because you might tell them something in a way that then helps you to understand it a little bit more. Um, something I've told people in the past, especially when they're just mashing the gas too much and like just over speeding things is you're not focusing too much on, on accelerating as much as possible. You want the car to go as fast as it can go in that moment. So if you're going, if, if you can only go 50 miles in this turn, there's no point in going 51, 52, 53 miles an hour and just keeping on the accelerator. You just want the car to be the right speed. You don't want to be, you don't want it to be too fast. Of course, you don't want it to be too slow, but you want to find the right speed for every moment of the course and maximize that. So you just hit on about that. It, 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 it dials you back. So a lot of people, especially newer people will think if I'm on the gas more, I'll go faster. And I, I even catch myself doing that every now and then. If I want to go faster on the course, I have to be on the throttle more. But that's not always true because now I might be over speeding corners. I might be just making more mistakes. Yep. And, and that's where the big thing I, I'm always talking to people at events trying to figure out what they're, what they're basing everything off of from their line to everything else. And the more I write with people lately as I think about this, it's how do you recognize when you're going over the limit too much? So if you're too aggressive, and he, like you said, I've done the same thing where I've done it too much, too much gas, too long or something for the ruins the braking zone. And I'm trying to really nail in on what are people missing and not recognizing. And the, the clues or keys that I'm noticing is people do the wrong inputs. So, okay, I'm going too fast in the slum, so I'm going to jerk the wheel even harder. I was like, at that point, you should have realized you need to slow down to go faster, which is usually the key for people that are going too fast. <laughs> you have to slow down. So my big thing in all this is what are people recognizing or not recognizing that I can point out to them and say, hey, here you did this and something didn't click in your brain to tell you I need to be over there on that line or I need to slow down to stay on the line. So I don't know if any of that relates to you, but if so, please add into that. That's the latest thing with people in my ride. I'm like, what did you clue in on or didn't clue in on there? Yeah, I mean, if you're talking about as far as like what mistakes most people make or what things people are tend to do. Yeah, exactly. And that's, um, it's just when I'm riding with them lately. So yeah, if you have any of those that you've experienced over and over, please share. Yeah, I think it's just a lot of people tend to forget about the line when they're trying to go faster. Um, you've touched on it a bunch with the distance to cones. If you can't look back and say that you were right on top of the cones or you were reasonably close to the cones, then you probably weren't paying enough attention to your line. Um, uh, another thing is like, um, if you're not getting the car to handle the way you want it because you're on throttle too much, um, that's another thing like over input, uh, over throttle, over steering, over braking, um, that gets people in trouble a lot. So it's just, getting people to recognize that the right amount of input is faster than more input um, and trying to get that, get that explanation and get that, get people to understand that. I, I think that's generally what you end up encountering. Um, and one of the things that I try to get people to recognize is if you're in a turn and let's make it a pin turn. So it's an extreme case. If you end up, missing the turn and you're not turning the car around and you're going faster, you're just going faster in the wrong direction. You're adding more distance and you're just adding more time. Exactly. So slow down, get the car turned and then worry about getting on the accelerator, get the car pointed where you want it to go and then get worry about the speed. That's like a double whammy basically is exactly what you just described. I'm too deep here. I might as well keep going really fast. Well, that might be two two mistakes instead of just one. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely can relate to that. No, that's that's good input and a different way to think about what the people are doing that you've seen that they do over. 
that's where I found some people at the last event I was at, they were anti-setting up. So, oh, I can be tight right here. I was like, and then it really made the next little three-cone solemn really hard to get into. And I was like, do you see those guys right there? I said, like, one happened to be John Ames once again. I said, he went out and threw up chalk line, even though people have run probably 40 runs already. He got out that much to get set up, which, and he's an anti-setup, but he would say never go extra distance for extra speed. Yet he was doing it. So I was trying to point out there, I was like, some places you're pinching yourself by not adding some distance, which that's the whole dichotomy of the sport. Everybody says drive a tight line, and then I'm like, whoa, but you can be too tight and really pinch something else and, and hurt that there, so... So tell me, have you done any video game playing, or would you give me credit to any of that? Um, in terms of video game racing, uh, not not too much. Um, I used to in the, a long time ago. I played a little bit of Lift for Speed, um, Gran Turismo, of course, um, with a steering wheel and everything, but just haven't found it to... I don't know if I want to say if it helps or not, doesn't help, but just really haven't kept up with it. It hasn't actually been as entertaining for me. I'd I'd rather just get in the car and drive or (laughs) go go go-karting or something. Okay, so tell us about the go-karting. How much, how long have you been doing that? Uh, um, I used to go-kart a lot. Um, Back in the day, I would go at least once a week. Um, Luckily, I had a go-kart place nearby. Actually, I've been keeping up with that as much lately, too. Um, so, yeah, what, these are indoor, outdoor, shifter, non shifters? Um, just non shifters, indoors. Yeah, I, I used to be quite addicted, and I swear I should just have a cart because now that there's a place probably 15, 20 minutes from here, especially the kids, I'm like, okay, once I get this one running better, I'm going to get them out there. I'm like, oh, I just know if you start that and you have a cart. It's like 30 or 40 bucks a day. I'm like, oh, this is trouble. <laughs> Fun, but probably trouble. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So none of that stuff. And I, I want to get in there. I don't think we had that on recording. So what else are you doing athletic-wise? Actually, first, what did you do before you autocrossed? Was there any racing except for the video games? Was there any sports? Um, so before I autocrossed, I played a lot of roller hockey. Um, not as much ice hockey, but hockey in general. Um, did that a lot through high school. Um, actually was, uh, on the Yukon roller hockey team as the assistant captain for a couple of years. Oh, nice. Um, so I did, I, I did that for a long time. Um, and it was tough at first because that was roughly when I got into racing. Um, I was always into cars, but I had never gotten an autocross until college. Um, and by then I was al- already playing. Um, so I was juggling responsibilities between uh, playing with the car and uh, playing roller hockey. I remember going to uh, away games um, and driving my Turbo 240. Um, I think I drove it to uh, there was a rink up in Maine when we had uh, some tournaments up there, um, Rhode Island, New Jersey. New Jersey, my car got broken into. That was not so much fun. <laughs> so... So, yeah. so you would, would you consider yourself competitive? Um, yeah, I've always been competitive, no matter what I'm getting into. Um, I'm not sure if that's a product of just the way I was raised or having a sister that was just good at everything. And <laughs> Yeah. So, so it, what do you think brings you back or got you hooked into autocross? Competitive, social, all of it, any of it specifically? So at first, it was definitely the competitive thing. Um, it was, I wanted to come back and win. And then in, in that process, it was tinkering more, and that kind of tickled the engineering side of me. Uh, like, you can't be in street mod if you don't love building things, um, and I love building things. Um, I'm always working on something or building something or developing something or trying to make something better. Um, That actually carries from when I was a kid. My mom was actually just telling my girlfriend that story about they would buy me toys and I would take them apart the second day that I owned them. So I'd end up with a bunch of broken toys that I'd be trying to put back together. Um, But yeah, it was definitely a competition at first, building things. And then it wasn't until later, um, really, the social aspect started kicking in. 
but that's actually probably one of the biggest reasons that I still do it now. Um, the, the camaraderie, the people, the friends, the things that we do, um, my favorite events of all time are probably Finger Lakes, uh, when we used to have divisionals and tours up there, um, up by, I think it was like Lake Seneca. Um, we would go up there and then we'd go camping, um, instead of getting a hotel and just hanging out at the campsites with a bunch of people who love cars, love doing the same thing. That was awesome. And then just, just recently this year, we had a Skoda, um, for the first time in a long time. And we ended up in a cabin, um, on a lake and that was tons of fun. We ended up having like 15 or 20 people over by and by the beach and just hanging out. It was just, it was more fun for a weekend. It was fun racing, but it was also fun once we were done racing. It's just, it, it's fun when it never stops. Um, and I think that's one of the draws to solo nationals is that solo nationals isn't just your six runs that you get to try to prove whether you're, a winner or a trophy or whether you see what your distance is to the guys that you want to stack up against. It's that those six runs, which is really big to an extent, but it's more, I think the you're there with 1300 people that all love what you love doing. Yeah, exactly. So, you, you're all nutty in some regard here and you're going to be able to find a little group yeah. that you fit in with very well. Yeah, so for me, I think the draw, the, the last one of it was the, the social aspect, but the social aspect is definitely the biggest in the long run. So yeah, yeah. Actually, bring... the social aspect is probably why I have my brother-in-law. Because he ended up meeting my sister through racing. So. <laughs> Matchracing.com. Go get it if you can. So what what's... Of the cars you've driven, I think you've talked about most of them. What can you pick a favorite? That's tough. Um, I mean, of my uh, picking my own cars, I actually my favorite is actually the 240SX that I owned before the current version of Panda. Um, so the current version of Panda is actually Panda Three. It's actually the third. Um, white 240SX that I've owned. Uh, the previous one was actually probably my favorite. And that one, um, I had built a wide body for. It was actually running on different wheels and everything like that. Um, it's hard to say whether that car would have been as fast as the current car. I think the current car is faster just as a product of development. But um, the second car, I... So the first Panda, I, I, I got to start the story off with the first Panda, which was the car that I had bought um, because I had, of course, crashed my uh, previous car, my first, two, my actually my second 240SX, my first S14 240SX. Um, bought, bought a car from a guy in Rhode Island for like $700, built the thing up, um, and that was the car that Dave White actually drove at the Team Challenge event I talked about earlier. Um, the, the car that got me into street modified and into a, into racing nationally. Um, we were on our way down to a DC Pro Solo, and we were hit by a drunk driver on the New York Thruway. Um, so when that car was totaled, I ended up finding another chassis in Rhode Island again. Um, but this one, the kid wanted like $1,300, and the car was just absolutely a piece of crap. So I offered him like five, settled for seven, and basically had to rebuild the entire thing. Um, that car, just because it looked so ratty and looked like it shouldn't have been as fast as it was, I think just it being the oxymoron of being this little tiny piece of crap that was just smoking Z06 Corvettes, or Z yeah, like was just the epitome of like where the innovation and engineering kind of took over the spending kind of thing. So I, I, I like that it was the underdog. I like that it was fast because I made it fast, not because I bought it fast. Um, so I think that was my favorite car. 
even though that car probably caused me more headaches and heartache than any other car that I've ever owned. Um, probably up close with my current car, which, of course, had the engine failure this year at Nationals. Um, but uh, Wait, Say that again. It did what at Nationals? What's that? It did what at Nationals? Failed you at Nationals? Uh, so my Infiniti failed me at Nationals this year. Yeah. yeah. I snapped the camshaft on day two while Becca Nell was running it in the ladies' class. Um, the cam was already failing on day one, and I didn't recognize that. Uh, we thought it was a sensor because he kept throwing a sensor code. Um, but what had happened was one of the cam bridge bolts had broke. Um, that, of course, led to the cam starting to become... Um, it wasn't retained, uh, so the lifters were bending the camshaft. So <laughs> it only lasted for so long. And I, it lasted maybe seven runs and then eventually failed. So um, it, was, it was slightly loose. Probably vibrations could get moved around and bent. Yeah, and well, unfortunately that motor is a really low red line. So we, had, we were overspinning the crap out of it trying to keep up with faster cars. Um, so it was... I don't know. I don't want to say it's a ticking time bomb, but the motor, the heads have uh, about 200,000 miles on them. So I'm not overly surprised. I have another motor in the garage already that I'm going to throw in for next year um, with a lot fewer miles. And we're going to hope for the best. Um, oh, I've got one for you. Yeah, get it. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Getting back to uh, Panda 2. So that car also being my favorite car, I think that was summarized best by, I think, Pat Salerno at one of the Delaware tour events. Um, I remember standing there, and I think it was Dave driving the car, um, but Pat was watching, and he's like an Evo instructor. He's always been one of the drivers that I've always looked up to, and he's just like, that fucking piece of shit fucking flies. And <laughs> that summed up Panda in a nutshell. <laughs> he's like, might, might look a little funny, but it was really fast. Yeah. So can you think of any um, breakthrough moments that you had or ideas or anything that, that really was like, wow, I get this, or that really helped me, that was a turning point, or a, a, a turning point to being much faster or competitive? Um, so I think one of those moments is when Chris Franson convinced me that all the JDM shocks were terrible <laughs> and that I should just get Coney's. Um, I had been running like these monotube shocks because they were monotube they were like i forgot what what jdm company but they were all like the they were all advertised as so many way adjustable shocks and whatnot and adjustable lower perches and upper perches and all this stuff but ultimately they just weren't effective and once i got conies on the car it was kind of just like a an aha moment like my car doesn't have to be horrible when i'm driving it on the street and it can also still handle really well, actually better than when I had those crap shocks on the car. So um, definitely one thing that I recommend to a lot of people now is get good shocks, whether you're getting Coney's, which I recommend highly, um, just because of their support at Nationals, and Lee Grimes has always been like a savior. Um, of course, you got Pro Parts and True Choice. Uh, Pro Parts is, are the guys that I go to for revalves and stuff and like they'll set you up with exactly what you want um, versus having like something unknown you know if you, if you want to go Penske custom valve Bilstein you know you name it uh, Moton like JRZ all those guys like good shocks are just going to be the, the best starting point that you can do that was probably the first big lesson that I ever learned um after yeah, that, truly how important cool. they are. Yeah. After that, it was a lot of not to get overly stuck in the engineering side of things, um, which I see every now and then in the street mob world um, where people are kind of focused in on the technology and the, the things on paper, the numbers. Um, it doesn't matter if you have the latest and greatest turbo or the best boost response or like a millimeter shorter intercooler cooler plumbing sacrificing something else like reliability, um, not to name names, 
or, yeah, I won't name anybody. Um, but I've seen it where people will not run an intercooler because that's going to add lag. Um, even though it's going to reduce reliability, even though it's going to have all these other adverse effects, you know, you're zoning in on all these performance parameters that you want to stick to, um, that may not make the car faster in the overall, um, especially if your car is not running in the end. Um, so not to get stuck in the nuances of setup and not in the nuances of building. You know. Especially I, reliability, even though I'm driving cars that usually are very reliable, I can't imagine going through what I see some of you guys go through. I think it was Eric Strollnick yeah. was out in D.C. when I drove out there. And I don't even know if he made it to the event time, but in the start line at some point, hopefully it was the event, something broke. He was done. I'm going to drive back to Texas. Yeah. And it's just like, even being at Nationals, I think it was 2001 or two, my first year, and seeing Street Mod and then coming back home, they go, you should go to Street Mod. I'm like, are you kidding me? I saw how much money we're putting in those cars and how much they broke. I just... I that I can't imagine going across the country and going, oh, I didn't get all my runs or any runs or, oh. It, it takes a different yeah, breed but, like you to keep going back and keep sticking with it and sticking with it. I mean, truly, <laughs> there is something about you willing to take things apart and get to put them back together. Yeah, I've, I've been lucky, actually, I think. Um, for the most part, my cars have held together when I needed to. I just put them through the ringer. <laughs> Um, so my 240 for at least a couple years, we had certain of some events where we were taking it to tours or pro solos. Um, so tours, we were running like six or eight drivers at a single, single tour event. Um, pro solos, there were years that the car had four drivers the entire time. It's, so it's, you put the cars through a lot too. Um, and they can be made reliable. I mean, I've, I've had pretty good spells, I, I, I would think, for a street mod car at least. I'm knocking on wood for you right now. It's not my head this time. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. So that, that's breakthrough. So I told you, asked you about your favorite car that you own. If you could drive anybody's car or cars out there, what's something you would like to jump into? Uh, probably uh, one of the A-mod cars. You're, you're ready um, for that insanity. Yeah. Um, just watching, was it KJ's car that Grace was driving? Yep. Yeah, that, that looks like a hoot. Uh, it's still something that I talked to a couple of friends about building one day. And that's where, I guess, with your engineering background, you could actually truly engineer one and either build it yourself, wall it together, or have somebody do that for you. Um, yeah, I would, I would hope that I could wall it together. <laughs> I've welded suspension components for a 2600-pound car, so... For a thousand pound car, shouldn't be as bad, maybe. <laughs> Just think, lots of downforce though. You got maybe different places that it's pushing. But it, it's insane. Yeah. And that's where we're talking with some of these people like Paul Russell in the cart. He pretty much says it ruins him for driving anything else. So same thing with A mod. Yeah. Once you go there, and that's probably what part of me is like, I don't want to get these faster cars because then all of a sudden the, the smaller, cheaper stuff is just going to be like, ugh, I can't believe I did that. I don't, I don't want that. <laughs> It's it's interesting because I mean I I've gone back and I've driven like street cars and they they provide their own challenge you know if you you can't think of it the same way um, the problem is when you make a mistake in an H street car you're sitting there thinking about it because you've made that mistake and you're still in the turn when you make that mistake in a mod car that you're already at the next turn and you don't have time to process that you've made a mistake. Um, but it's, it's a different challenge, and if you can recognize that it's that challenge that each of those little mistakes is going to carry with you for that long, and you need to really drive that car that much more perfect to really dial that thing in, then you can kind of appreciate it for what it is and for the challenge that it provides. So, oh, true, true. It, it, can, it, it can still be fun to drive something that's a lot slower than a mod car, or even a street prepared car. Oh yeah, no, I, that's I mean that's what I've been doing the whole time. So I get it. it just uh, I guess at some point I should say I should try to get one just to see the craziness. When I got in a street mod Miata that was supercharged, <clears throat> that was bonkers. 
I mean, it was like wowzers. Yeah. And most Corvettes to me, if they're a Z06 or something, I just like, wow, this has a lot of power. I have to really, really, really pay attention to things I don't usually pay attention to whatsoever with the gas pedal. It's, it's yeah. I always like it. Almost everybody on the podcast wants to drive something that fast or get in Kiesel's car. And that's where Kiesel's car honestly scares me. I'm like, that is nuts when I watch the videos. And yet you may be experiencing some of this with the G-forces, with the grip level you have. I'm just like, it's insane. Like on, off, on, off. Like zip, zip, zip. I'm just, I am truly fascinated by how, how that must feel and how I even can keep up with those cars. Like, like the inputs, like you're saying in A mod, you don't have time to even realize, oh, what happened back there? Oh, I might hit five more cones up here. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've autocrossed the shifter cart before. So that's probably the fastest thing I've ever autocrossed. Um, but like I said, it's, it's a different challenge. It's, it's just, um, it's just different. I mean, it's, it's fun because it's fast. It's fun because you're out of control. With a shifter cart, you've got such a short wheelbase, you're really being punished for every time that you're, you're turning in too fast or you're, the car is getting loose or you're on throttle too much. Um, How long do you drive that? Just, um, just a couple. Like, I've on and off had a couple of events. Like I said, I had a friend with a shifter cart. Um, so it wasn't like a long-term thing. It was just a now and then whenever he brought it out. But... Uh, so, so how was the shifting fun. part of that for you? I mean, you, you've obviously done lots of karting, but was the shifting, is that something that sl- has slowed you down or not? Um, so the first time I'd ever drove it, I came back in, and I thought I did decent, and he's like, you're, you're short shifting like crazy out there. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and sure enough, I'm not used to things spinning that fast. I forgot what its red line was. It was like eleven or 14,000 or something like that. So... Hmm. You're like, oh, I did not realize that I was doing that. And that's where even, yeah. it's funny you say that because S2000s or in Type R Integra, people get in these cars and they'll shift. I'm like, what, what are you doing? You should do like 5,000 or 6,000 RPMs. Like you were almost into VTEC. You almost had some kind of reward for no torque. <laughs> and they, yeah, they just, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. You don't know. So is, any favorite memories that, any autocross thing that's something you can leave us with? Oh, man. There's a lot of them. What kind of, what kind of context do you want? I don't know. It doesn't matter. I just some, Once again, a story or something you can share, that something that stands out to you or several things. That's fine. Uh, that's such an open-ended question. There's a lot of things out there, too. Um, hmm. I don't know, something that stands out to you. Some people are talking about even road trips they've had or, I don't know. Some, some, hey. Yeah, that's the problem. I've had a lot of those, too. I mean, <laughs> I've got times. Um, my first ever trip to Skoda, um, my current co-driver, um, his alternator broke. So we ended up having to charge. He ended up buying a spare battery and a battery charger and an inverter. And so in the tow vehicle that I was driving, we were charging his battery and then swapping it out every time we stopped into his car and then charging that battery. But he was just driving his car the entire way back on battery power. Um, let's see. Um, other stories. I mean, there's, there was one time, my first time to Dixie, to do uh, the Dixie tour in Valdosta, Georgia. Okay. Um, I drove down there with Chris Franson in my street modified 240SX. Um, towing a tire trailer. So we're in a street mod car um, towing something. And, of course, the car was fine the entire way down. Um, we had to replace a trailer wheel bearing, I think halfway, somewhere in the Carolinas, um, until I think we were like a mile from site and the car just stalled. Could not figure out what was wrong with it. Um, and the car had been just running fine the entire time. Um, I forgot what I ended up doing, but like, it was something that shouldn't have fixed it, but the car ended up running, ran the event fine. Um, Chris Franson actually won his first tour there. Um, and then uh, we ended up having like an uneventful trip back at all this time like in a street modified car that wasn't being towed. Um, the next year, we, we planned on doing the same event, but 
the next year was, I think, the year that my other 240 um, was being rebuilt. So the car wasn't ready in time. Um, we ended up taking the Infinity that I had uh, all the way down. But I had spent the entire night trying to get the 240SX ready because I really wanted to run that in street mod. Um, so I had spent, up, spent the entire night working on this car. It was cold. I think it was, like, partially raining. And I ended up getting, like, a flu or something like that. It was, like, deathly sick. And Chris ended up driving the entire, I want to say it was, like, a 17-hour trip down, like, with me not being able to talk. Um, oh. And I couldn't drive, couldn't talk, was passed out in the passenger seat the entire way. I remember we stayed at a hotel because he just couldn't drive, and then we got up in the morning. And I remember, like, Southern Hospitality, just, like, them, like, like, we were, like, ordering food, and the waitresses were all just, like, trying to be really nice. But um, Chris was a good sport about it. He ended up just ordering everything for me. Um, that's a whole other story in itself. Yeah. Um, hmm. Yeah. No, I've got a lot of stories about towing, about road trips, um, events, what have you. Yeah, that's some of my fun. Even if I'm by myself sometimes, it's just fun. I'm, I'm headed out like Packwood this year. I did it again. I'm like, am I really going to do this? Yes, I am. And I'm picking yeah. up ducks of all things. <laughs> One did survive. Yeah. We took him. He got full that's, grown. <laughs> that's definitely a bucket list item. Um, to go to Packwood. Packwood looks like an awesome site. Yeah. It's, it, and once again, if you can do other things around there, like when I brought my kid, we stopped by and saw the volcano, things like that. Can you spend some time out there and go to the um, the glaciers up there? Do some hiking. It's it's a truly unique place. Yeah. Very very unique. Well, PJ, thank you for the time. Do you have anybody you would like to thank or anything else? If so, throw it in. Um, pretty much like uh, thank all my crew definitely, uh, especially my sister. My sister's been a huge help lately. Uh, I don't think I'd be racing pretty much at all if she wasn't helping me out like uh over the last year or so uh especially with like logistics and everything so jojo juggling two kids now and a husband um dave and todd of course for trying to manage as much of the 240 as they could um this year and still running it um my co-driver brian and becca uh, that i've been running the infinity with they're uh Probably the best co-drivers. Uh, actually, I can't say they're the best co-drivers ever because I've also got Dave, Todd, Tom, everybody else. Um, but yeah, they're my favorite co-drivers currently, uh, <laughs> helping with the ESP car. Um, yeah, how do you yeah, handle? Do, how, do you, how are you handling two cars? Plus doing rock climbing, uh, plus roller hockey. How, how does this work? Yeah, it's it's tough. Um, and, and a girlfriend. And a girlfriend. <laughs> Yeah, and I definitely have to thank my girlfriend for uh, being as understanding as she is about me being as crazy as I am. I did warn her uh, when we first started dating, though, so to be fair. Um, <laughs> yeah, so Sam Sam definitely knew. Uh, but no, she's been good about it as long as I'm reasonable. Uh, <laughs> thanks to my co-drivers being reasonable, I've been reasonable. So um, Helps make it all possible. Yeah, juggling it's hard. It's... Um, it's always a struggle to find time during the day uh, and at night. Um, but, you know, if you love doing something, you, you're just going to do it. You're going to find a way to make it happen. So, Very cool. Well, thanks again for all the time and insights and the stories. Yeah. No, thanks for uh, letting me, let me ramble on about all the crap that I've gone through. Thanks again. This was good. <laughs> all right. Cool. We'll PG. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Yep. All right, bye. Yep, take care. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening. For the show notes and contact information, please visit autocrosstalk.com. There you can also subscribe so that we can keep you up to date on new shows as they come out. Also, please leave us a review on iTunes and subscribe on iTunes for the upcoming shows. You can connect to our Facebook page at facebook.com slash autocrosstalk. 
You can share your thoughts, your insights, your questions, your suggestions there. Also, share with your friends. Hopefully, you found it entertaining and motivating, and hopefully other people will as well. It's been fun, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for listening, and check back next week for the next show.